Yes. Hello. Hello. Thank, thank you very much for coming on and helping me with my decision making process here. Uh, oh yeah. I'm things going on here. your side. Going well. I've been excited about this since you uh, proposed it. So. Oh, excellent, yeah. excellent. Well, okay. So for everybody, uh, the the situation is I've got that uh, uh, arboreal. It's uh, what we see in the background there. I'll put it up, but uh, that's the arboreal XL, and uh, that enclosure is specifically for bioactive. It even has this bioactive forest floor viewing window. That's a special feature I put in because. I want to see my isopods, yeah. my frogs. <laughs> and so, so, all right, Russ, this is the situation. Mm -hmm. I am trying in, in the process of figuring out what I'm going to be putting in this enclosure. Okay. And there's a number of options that I have available to me. And the isopods that I put in will be different depending upon which of those I selected. So I'd like to go over a number of scenarios with you and have you help me decide which isopods to put in there. First of all, let's figure out what are the important parameters that you need to know to, uh, to help me with this. Okay. Uh, well, definitely ventilation and airflow and how they can be customized in the enclosure. Uh, general well, humidity, air humidity can, can be more important for some species of ice pods than others. Um, many are adaptable to a wide range and others uh, less so. So there's that. Uh, gradients of moisture. Okay. Um, what kind of uh, hides are available to the ice pods? What kind of uh, plant growth uh, you're looking for um, in terms of, you know, if you have prized plants that you don't want to be nibbled on uh, or it's just kind of, there's plant growth in there and you expect some of it to be nibbled on a little bit and for it to kind of grow and be more natural in that way. Uh, and temperature range. And then of course, whether or not the macro fauna you're putting in there is going to be preying on the ice buds or not. Uh, those are some things that immediately come to mind. Okay. Well, uh, let's go. Actually, maybe I ought to ask first mm -hmm. the whole idea of what do isopods eat? Uh, I mean, I've got a bunch of leaves in there and I know they eat, uh, do they really eat leaves? They do. Uh, isopods prefer leaves that have been decaying for a while, uh, partially to, to a large degree because they're actually after the bacteria that are eating the leaves and, and you know, conceivably um, fungi and other uh, microorganisms that are consuming the leaves, the isopods uh, are, are after those more than they're after the leaves themselves. They will eat dry uh, leaf litter, but they're not going to get near as uh, near the nutrition from those the dry leaf litter as they would from decaying, you know, the leaves for that reason. But they're not particular when they're hungry. They will eat uh, okay. both dry and, and decaying leaves. They'll eat a lot of other things too. And of course, we're kind of counting on that in a bioactive setup because they will eat um, feces from uh, reptiles and amphibians. They will eat uh, r remains of insects. A cricket leg falls off, you know, they'll eat that that kind of thing, as well as uh, if there are parts of plants that are dying or dead, um, not leaf litter per se that you put in there necessarily, but leaf litter that's generated from the uh, plant growth in the enclosure uh, and, you know, almost anything they can find. They're pretty uh, generalistic as far as eating things dead and decaying matter. They're detritivores, so uh, they, they tend not to be predatory. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, but uh, that that's kind of their their jam. All right, so I keep I hear that isopods need or want protein. Uh, it doesn't sound like there's a whole lot of protein in the leaves unless that bacteria is counted as protein. But what's the protein situation? So there are some some interesting things to be be discussed there. In the hobby, there's the common phrase, you know, that the isopod species are protein hungry or or less protein hungry or not protein hungry. And there's been some experimentation, like uh, Kyle of Roach Crossing did an experiment to kind of see whether this had any uh, any weight to it. And he put the same weight of some vegetable matter, I think it was a kind of fruit, and uh, a piece of raw meat. And he put it in an enclosure, and then he very carefully measured the numbers of isopods 
going after each of them at regular intervals so he could get some you know statistically significant information over whether they preferred the the raw meat or the piece of fruit and after doing that for an extended period of time he determined that there was no statistical significance over what these isopods preferred they they were they were hungry and they were eating both uh, and they were probably getting some some moisture from both but there was not it's not like they swarmed the meat and ignored the uh, the fruit or anything like that. They okay. just, so they're not necessarily as particular as people might indicate. And there is uh, there's another phenomenon that influences this, and I think uh, one it's it's species. Uh, some species have a much stronger food drive than others. For example, I have um, two desktop enclosures of two different species of ice, but I have a Porcelia levis in one, and I have uh, Armadillidium gestor in another, and Porcelia lavis, it doesn't matter what I throw in there, they're going to be swarming it really fast. Within a few minutes, so there'll be a ball of isopods over almost anything that I put in there. And certain foods, of course, more than others, but uh, the gestor are not going to do that. They just, it's not something that uh, they tend to do unless uh, there are really large numbers of isopods and low quantities of food. So all of these factors play in. Species have, have different uh, feeding responses in terms of how fast and how aggressively they're going to go after food. And also density of the ice pods themselves and availability of food resources. So all of all of those things are going to play into that. Okay. Well, I'd like to start off instead of going through my scenarios. Let's Let's talk about what if I just had isopods how do i set up a system so i can have a healthy colony of isopods regardless of what what species or why i have them in respect to the apex predator okay yeah well, well some things to think about are first of all ventilation most isopods uh well all isopods need of course some oxygen but some are very uh comfortable in pretty low ventilation, low airflow scenarios. Others uh, prefer a lot of airflow. In general, I think uh, many, if not most isopods, are fine with uh, moderate to even high airflow as long as they have a humidity gradient uh, in the enclosure, or a moisture gradient, I should say, because less uh, the air humidity is a little less important than being able to, uh, isopods being able to basically regulate their moisture intake by going to a moist part of the enclosure and then going to another one. So I like to call it a hydration station, making sure that there's always a place in an enclosure they can go to where there is, it could be saturated uh, sphagnum moss. It's just always, always damp. It could be another type of substrate that's always damp. Uh, it doesn't really matter uh, in like what exactly it is to to a large extent they could be a lot of different things but it needs to be moist and they need to be able to to put their bodies up against it to uh, access that moisture if they don't have that most isopod species will die very quickly even if air humidity is fairly high okay now do they need a dry area as well depends on the species some species do much better if they can dry out uh, when they need to for as long as they need to uh, they tend to have uh, mist molts and things like that if they don't have it. Uh, and then there are other species that seem to do fine if it's just uniformly moist. So it's very much a species to species thing. If we were to watch our isopods, what would be the signs that they need more water or they need uh, less or an area to dry out? Mm, okay. Well, many times if it is too moist, uh, they will try to climb up onto something higher to get away from it. Um, that tends to be the major sign, I would say. They're, they might climb on top of each other. If they have like a piece of cork bark or some other decor, they might try to climb up on top of that and stay away from the moist substrate. Uh, if they're getting dry, they will tend to burrow if, if that's an option to them, if the substrate is... Uh... And there are species that will burrow anyway, many fossorial isopods and some less so, but... Uh, any isopod that dries out will tend to burrow down to try to get to a, a moisture mm -hmm. layer of substrate. And they will also tend to congregate in the moistest area of the enclosure. So if there's a water dish in the enclosure, they'll try to head 
get close to it, it or there's just a vestige of moisture in one part of the enclosure more than another, it'll tend to congregate there. Okay. For feeding them, mm -hmm. does the type of leaf matter? It does. And I would say there are two main broad categories of leaf. There are the uh, slower decaying leaves like oak, magnolia, sea grape, uh, some of the ones that we favor for uh, vivarium with dart frogs and things like that because they are uh, they are slow to decay and so they they're they're nice that way. Uh, those are, tend to be fairly nutritious when they break down, but they take a long time to break down. Okay. And so you could have leaves in an enclosure for months before the ice pods can really utilize them as much of a food source. And then you have the other more quickly decaying leaves, things like maple or uh, red bud, or uh, there are so many others, apple. Um, I'm thinking some of the ones that I use, plum, pear, things like that, that tend to be a lot softer and thinner and decay more quickly. And so that the nutrients are accessible more quickly. I find that it's best to give a mix of wide variety because nu nutrient profiles are going to vary in the leaves and the decay rate is going to vary. And so you'll get the best results if you can mix them. Okay. Are there any leaves that are dangerous that you can't use or shouldn't use? Um, any with, with uh, to known toxins, I tend to try to avoid, uh, even though a lot of those, once they have dried naturally, uh, can be safer for the ice pods. For example, there was a study done with, uh, I believe it was walnut leaves, which do have some natural toxins. Once they dry out, ice pods will eat them, but they tend to have too many toxins for them to eat green. Um, I avoid cherry leaves. I have like three cherry trees, but I don't give them cherry leaves because they're cyanides associated with cherries. And mm -hmm. in certain conditions, and rather than try to determine and guess when these toxins might be active, I just avoid the cherry leaves. Mm -hmm. um, then there are softwoods, anything like pine needles and uh, fir needles, that kind of stuff can be too resinous for the ice pods. And then, so it's not particularly safe and they can have uh, some aromatic um, substances that probably aren't good for the ice pods either. So while you can find ice pods in a place where like a pile of dry pine needles is sitting and that might not cause them any problems, but in general, that's something to avoid. I see. Okay. And if I had a, a colony of isopods down there and I had a, a, a mix of leaves, say I have magnolia, which is a slow breakdown. I believe ash is a quicker breakdown. Mm -hmm. Sycamore. Yeah. Mix up all together. Is there anything else that I would need to feed the isopods? Like I see these dried shrimp that people feed. Right. Uh, it is nice to vary uh, what you're feeding them uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, isopods do, I've noticed they seem to crave some variety to some extent. They can have one food that's in the enclosure and they might nibble on it a little bit and then leave it alone. And I put another different food in there and they'll, they'll go after it. So they're probably uh, trying to regulate their nutrient profile a little bit. Okay. Uh, we know that some insects like roaches will do that. And, and it seems likely that isopods would probably do that as well. Um, often with a good mix of leaf litter, you don't necessarily need to add other things. They do like some properly decayed wood where the lignans have broken down, but there's plenty of cellulose. Um, they like that. Uh, they like uh, protein sources. Like you say, you could put dried shrimp in there. Uh, I like to offer things like fish food pellets that often contain things like fish meal, shrimp meal, as well as because the, the fish meal includes the bones of the fish, there's some calcium there, which is good for ice pods. Um, unlike many insects, uh, their exoskeletons do have a fair proportion of calcium in them. And so they need calcium in their diet and they need a decent amount of it. Um, it can be, it is present in leaf litter. And the more you mix the leaf litter, the more likely you're going to get some leaves that have a decent amount of calcium in them. So you don't necessarily need to supplement calcium other than that, but it is often, the ice pods will often swarm calcium. So they seem to crave the calcium. So it doesn't seem to do any harm to give them some additional calcium. You can give them cuddle bone like that that's used for, uh, you know, pet birds and tortoises and things like that. They will really swarm and eat that. And it is a soft form of calcium. They can't really do much with big chunks of limestone or anything. They can't seem to even even an eggshell. If you put a dried eggshell in, in their hole or, you know, in the pieces, you broke it into two pieces to open the egg, put it in there. I've experimented with putting those in the enclosure and seeing what happens. And they don't 
show significant wear even after months. And other others have done the same. But if you grind up the eggshell, they will come and eat it. Uh, if you uh, put in powdered limestone, they will eat it. You have to be careful not to inhale that because that can be dangerous. But uh, you put some powdered uh, calcium carbonate in there, they'll eat that. So uh, they are attracted to it. I have some idea that if uh, you want to help preserve the eggs of, say, geckos, that uh, you know many geckos have a fairly bird-like eggshell with a lot of calcium in it. And um, this is speculation to some degree, but I would imagine that isopods would be a little less likely to attack a, a shell if they have a ready source of calcium. Okay. So my first uh, concern would be, uh, can I set up this enclosure so uh, my isopods will be happy and they will reproduce and produce a colony? Is there anything that I need to do to facilitate that? Or do I just feed them, give them hiding places, water, and they take care of everything else? To a large extent, most of them will, will breed pretty readily as long as they have that hydration station. They have places to hide, plenty of places to hide and congregate. Um, sheets of uh, cork bark, for example, would be great, especially if they're uh, slightly concave. Some species especially okay. favor more concave um, bark surfaces under which to congregate. And they have plenty of leaf litter, some of that supplementary food I, I mentioned. Uh, they should, most species will breed pretty contentedly in that scenario. Okay, let's assume that I do everything right and these guys are very happy. Is there going to be an eventual problem with overpopulation? It could be. There's going to be a lot of factors going into that. Uh, some species are, of course, more prolific than others. Um, it also depends on uh, how many, the, the quantities of the various um, limiting factors in the environment that are going in uh, and predation and other sources of uh, uh, basically the demise of some of the isopods in the population. For example, in some enclosures, water dishes can constitute a death trap for isopods mm -hmm. and they will just fling themselves into the water dishes and, and drown themselves. Uh, so depending on how that's set up and but I think predation is going to be a big one. And then how many resources are going in um, that are available for the isopods and then the species? All of those are going to play in. Uh, let's say we get to a problem where there's an overpopulation. Are they just going to self-limit or is my entire colony going to crash and I have to start over? Um, both scenarios are possible. In general, what I have found is that as long as they have some degree of you know, you make sure there's enough leaf litter in there and you make sure that their basic needs are met. I haven't had big problems with isopods overpopulating a vivarium. Mm -hmm. I just haven't, haven't had that issue. Um, in an enclosure just for isopods, separately from a bioactive vivarium, certain species, it can be an issue. Uh, okay. But that you tend to feed those isopods in those scenarios for the population rather than uh, allow them to subsist on what you want in the enclosure. And so there's a difference there. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and take some scenarios. I have a couple of different plans for what I could do with this enclosure back here. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is a simple one. I'm going to have a panther chameleon in there. If I have a panther chameleon in there, then uh, my I would be looking for isopods, which are large enough to be predated upon because that's a really good uh, source of calcium right. and uh, ones that might be active during the day and would have no problem poking their heads up from the leaf litter every now and then to uh, get the chameleon's attention. So in that scenario, what, uh, what species would be uh, for me to pick from? Okay. Well, how large would an isopod need to be to be of interest to a panther chameleon? I'd say half an inch. Now, chameleons will sometimes go after fruit flies, even an adult panther. So sometimes they do it just for fun. And honestly, I had a bunch of dairy cows mm -hmm. in an enclosure this size with a panther chameleon. And when the panther chameleon figured out what was going on, I found the panther chameleon on the ground, nudging some leaves over <laughs> and actively hunting for my dairy cows <laughs> that I love so much. <laughs> so... Um, uh, they enjoy, it, it's actually a form of enrichment. Right. Uh, and, and people uh, report that 
in a bioactive enclosure where they have the isopods, they'll see their pantochameleons just hanging down from a branch, just looking for a little bit of movement. So it's a valuable addition to their life. It, it uh, enriches their life just to have those regardless of the nutritional content. Right, they're engaging in behaviors that are more like what they might do in the wild as they're foraging for prey, so totally makes sense. And it's interesting you should mention dairy cows because that would be uh, one of my top picks for this situation. Okay. Absolutely, they're very prolific, and um, as you mentioned, the, the panther chameleon is very attracted to them. Uh, and so I would say my absolute top picks are both uh, dairy cows and milkbacks because they're very similar. They're actually the same species, just different. They have different appearance, different morphs, but okay. they are they're the same species. It's hard to beat them in terms of being prolific, being large enough, being bold enough to show up in an enclosure like that, and um, and being able to uh, to use enough of the enclosure, and utilize enough of the space in there in, in ways that will allow them to survive uh, mm -hmm. indefinitely, even with some predation. Okay. And so uh, are there any challenges with them or, or any special needs to keep them happy? Well, what I do, and I've experimented a bit with this, not exactly with the same species we're talking about, but this, this in principle, is that when you have something that is being preyed upon, even, even to, and I don't know what you found, if you were able to maintain a population of dairy cows in that enclosure uh, indefinitely or not. The one you mentioned. Uh, you're talking about with my panther chameleon. The one, yeah, the mentioned the one that was hunting. Did you find that he r rendered them extinct, or what did you find? Well, to be determined. Okay. Uh, I was. I've not been able to find them, but uh, I haven't dug through. Uh, they've got a, uh, a thick layer of light uh, bioactive uh, substrate, so the the possibility that there are babies in there very high mm -hmm. but uh, yeah the adults are very hard to find i was I haven't been able to find them okay uh, and so i think um i i still stand by the idea of using dairy cows or milk bags in an enclosure like that as the best option but i'll give you a couple of uh pointers for success okay i'm making sure that you have enough in there because i find it fairly likely there are some but we know of at least one crustacean species that alters its behavior based on whether or not predators are present in terms of how much it is, uh, engages in cryptic behaviors. Uh, and it's, I don't know of any research specifically on isopods with that, but other crustaceans, yes. So it is very possible that uh, the, the dairy cows could be altering their behavior to uh, just be preyed on less. Okay. So they might be coming out more at night. They might be just spending more time down in the substrate, things like that. So I would say that two things you can do. One is give them a little bit of supplemental food um, to make sure that they are getting enough to maintain a population. It would just kind of a little boost. Like you could open, you could take a, a leaf or two and put some fish food pellets underneath the leaf and then cover them back up so that uh, the isopods are more likely to come get it. And then with that extra food, they, they're more likely to be able to reproduce and just maintain a higher population in the enclosure. And then, Would the dried shrimp work for that? A dried shrimp could be a good option to help with that, yes. Okay. Yeah. Because that's what I was doing. I was throwing dried shrimp in there in, in an area where he couldn't see. So uh, ho okay. hopefully <laughs> giving him the best chance possible. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that is a, a good way to go then. It sounds like you're already on top okay. of that. Um, another thing I would do, and this is just whenever there's predation in a bioactive enclosure of the isopods, if, if you know what's happening, this best practice is to have an isopod culture and just renew it. You know, have okay. a place where you're culturing dairy cows, get a 16 quart tub or whatever, and just feed those for the, the fastest growth you can. And then every so often, depending on how much, you know, how often you're seeing them, how often they're being preyed on and so on, just throw 50 in there and just okay. keep, keep that up. And then you're more likely to be able to maintain a population because you're, you're reducing pressure on the ones that are already in there if you're adding some, but also um, if they are getting predated on to such an extent that it's a sink area, ecologically speaking, and they're just, uh, it is causing their extinction, you're, you're renewing it. And so you can, you can maintain a population better that way. So this enclosure here is uh, 36 inches 
uh, wide. It is 30 inches deep. And so I've got that 36 by 30 inches uh, ground space. Mm -hmm. How much, uh, how many isopods are the uh, dairy cows would you uh, recommend to seed that? Just to get it started initially? Yeah. I would say, um, I think people often underestimate this. You want to get a good start and you want it to happen quickly. I mean, dairy cows, you could put 10 in there and you'd eventually have enough if there's not a predator in there yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if you put 10 in there and the the uh, chameleon manages to get, you know, six of them and you have four left and three are males and, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So I would say put as many as you can in. It's often easy to get dairy cows fairly cheaply. I wouldn't hesitate to put between 80 to 100 in there just to get started. Okay. All right. Okay, that's for the uh, the panther chameleon scenario. And uh, what do I have to uh, look out for as far as temperature and humidity for dairy cows? Dairy cows are extraordinarily um, adaptable. I wouldn't worry about it much. Anything that's going to be comfortable for the chameleon is going to be fine for them, as long as they do have that moist area, that hydration station available at all times. Uh, I wouldn't worry about it. Will the dairy cows start climbing on the branches? They might, um, they might start climbing on the branches. I feel like uh, without the uh, chameleon in there, if you just let them keep going, they would eventually do that as their population got bigger and they, they tend to explore quite a bit. So it would happen. I don't know how much of that you would see with a chameleon in there that would be preying on anything that uh, got visible enough for long enough to get to the branches. Now you think they'd come out during the day? Oh yeah, yeah. In general, they tend to, they tend to be one of the bolder uh, okay. isopod types, both dairy cows and milkbacks. Uh, if people ask for a day active isopod, that's not my top pick. So. Okay. Now, I, I know someone's going to ask this, and why not? Uh, would the chameleon be in any danger of being nibbled on during the night? I think that that is often overblown, but it does depend, once again, on the density of the isopods, how much food they have, and so on. Starving isopods are starving isopods, and they tend to get... Uh, you know, they'll, they'll experiment. I have had, I'll reach into a very hungry isopod enclosure that has lots and lots of isopods in it. And I'll have the isopods climb up on me and start nibbling on my hands. So that is a thing. Um, it doesn't appear to do any damage to me. It certainly doesn't hurt. And I don't think they're actually doing anything. Maybe they're taking off a thin layer of, uh, you know, they're basically exfoliating that area perhaps at, at worst. So, um, they they do tend to be more attracted to dead material uh so i think there have been cases when people find a dead reptile and the isopods are swarming it and they attribute the death to the isopods and i think that's probably not mm. very uh, likely at all uh, but if you had a thousand starving uh dairy cows and you had a chameleon in with them i, I wouldn't i wouldn't put it past them to climb up on the chameleon and start nibbling but they'd have to be in pretty dire straits to, to get to that point i think if they have other food sources, I don't think that's where they're going to go. And how much damage could they do? It, yeah, and that's the question. Just from my own experience, having had them crawl up into my hands and, and nibble, I can feel it. I feel a little a little scraping kind of thing, but it's completely painless to me. So I would assume that if we're an ice pod were to climb up on a chameleon's foot or something like that, I don't think it would do a whole lot uh, based on that. Okay. All right, then, uh, so we've got that, uh, and temperature and humidity. For the dairy cows specifically. Yeah, yeah. Anything within, like, cooler than room temperature from down in the, like, low 60s or even maybe high 50s up into the mid 80s, I don't think you have anything to worry about uh, okay. as far as temperature goes. So somewhere in there, and I'm sure the chameleon uh, optimal temperature ranges fall within that. And, yep, and are it's right in there. there. So, um <laughs> Then the uh, humidity, you know, it's really not an issue as long as they have that uh, moisture gradient on the substrate that they can okay. can regulate themselves and it's not really a problem at all. All right, then let's go with the scenario where, say, I put in an emerald tree boa in there. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing the isopods need to do is take care of a snake poop every, uh, couple, every couple of weeks and look pretty. So this is a point where there's no danger to the isopods, and I can actually have uh, a, a show specimen isopods. What, what are my options? 
Well, uh, I would look into maybe some of the large Spanish Porcelio species, knowing the, uh, the ventilation possibilities you have in that enclosure, that it's got the low vents on the side and then it's had an open screen top. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, the uh, bioactive substrate in there is going to help keep humidity up somewhat. There are some large Mediterranean Porcelio species like Porcelio expansus, which is absolutely gorgeous, gets really big. Um, some others that are related to that, uh, Porcelio succinctus, um, Porcelio ornatus, Porcelio species Sevilla. There are quite a few others that are kind of showy uh, and okay. can get quite big. And the ventilation in there sounds like it would be good. Uh, and especially if they have some structures they could climb on, that things like cork bark or, or whatever to climb up on. I think they could do pretty well in an enclosure like that. You might want to provide like supplemental shrimp and things like we talked about. Um, they, they do tend to like their protein a bit uh, in terms of getting the nice growth and so on, but they get really large, have amazing patterns. Uh, you could do something like that. Uh, I haven't done a whole lot with Marulanella, the genus Marulanella, but they're kind of the biggest craze in isopods right now. Um, and they have very striking colors. They tend to be very day active. And that, that could be an option as well. Uh, okay. And they, the, the colors on those are just out of this world. They have very descriptive names like Red Ember Bee and things like that, or Diablo. And they are very, uh, very contrasting patterns, very bright colors. Uh, could be an option in an enclosure like that as well. Okay. Could I put in the uh, famous rubber duckies? You could. Uh, you just probably wouldn't see them all that much. Okay. And so that I, I thought about that briefly and I thought, I oh, probably won't see them hardly at all in an enclosure like that. Um, you could put in something like Armadillidium gestroy, which is a nice, big, bulky tank of an isopod. It's not as big as like the Porcelia expanses that I mentioned earlier, that is just gigantic, but it is, uh, it's robust and, and roundish, and it has very bright colors, very bright pattern, very contrasting pattern. And they do nibble on plants some, but I don't think with a, you, you have a lot of nice, healthy plant growth in there. I think yeah. that if, in, if they're gonna nibble, they, they might nibble on some of those plants, but I don't think they would okay. eat them all to the ground or anything. I can share. Yeah. Uh, and is there any danger or complication in having different species of isopods in the same area? They do tend to outcompete each other okay. over time, and sometimes it takes a while. In a large enclosure with different uh, microenvironments, you have a better chance of keeping more species together longer. But okay. uh, whenever I've done that for more than like a year and a half, I usually find, oh, that species is done now. <laughs> it it tends right. to happen over time. So um, the more you can provide those microenvironments and the more that you can make sure that they have access to resources, the, the more success you'll have with, with that kind of thing. Okay. And then you can also select for isopods that tend to favor different microenvironments to maximize your success. All right. We're going to go into the uh, third scenario, which is... I could have a an enclosure that has dart frogs in the uh, at the bottom, has your Plato's fantasticus, the leaf-tailed geckos, in the canopy mm -hmm. and running around during the night, and a small species of chameleon, whether it's a Brookesia stump-tailed chameleon, or one of these first for Wilsey or a carpet chameleon, and so the question is, in a community tank like that i don't call it a community tank <laughs> in a large enclosure that has a community like that first of all what can you tell me about isopods and dart frogs that are in the same area and the uh, say the europlatus fantasticus may very and some of the chameleons may very well lay eggs down in the leaves uh leaf litter so what kind of isopods would work well in that scenario? Well, the, the first two that come to mind are the, the tried and true species that have been kept with dart frogs for a long time now. And those would be the dwarf whites, uh, which, you know, there's some controversy about dwarf whites and how they might deal with eggs. But I think that goes back to some of the things we were talking about was what is available to them 
are they starved for nutrients and overcrowding the enclosure, that kind of thing. Uh, then, uh, so definitely that one would be an option. And we know that they, there's a long history of success with dart frogs and that species. Okay. Uh, then Porcelio scaber is the other one that was uh, introduced probably about the same time as dwarf whites into the dart frog hobby and also does does very well and many people have had success with keeping those with dart frogs uh, for many many years uh, without particular problems uh, the dart frogs will tend most dart frog species are not uh, going to prey on the adults because they get significantly larger than the dwarf whites but they will prey upon the smaller individuals and so they kind of help regulate the population with dwarf whites they will eat the adults because they're small enough so there's that, but then since dwarf whites reproduce through parthenogenesis, you're very unlikely to, cause, to have an issue where you cause an extinction of the entire population, and so that they can grow and shrink as, as conditions are more favorable. Uh, some other options, you have uh, the Florida fast isopods, um, Atlantosha floridana. They're somewhere in between the size of Porcelius scaber and, and dwarf whites. They're not really a dwarf, tiny dwarf, but they don't get a whole lot bigger and they're extremely fast. They run extremely quickly. And so uh, they're likely to escape some of the predation from many of those species. And some of them will likely get picked off, but they're extremely fast runners. Uh, they're good breeders. It, they really need a moist area, but as long as they have one, they, they tend to do really well. Um, there's the uh, Trichoniscus species dwarf purple. Very similar to dwarf whites in many ways, but just kind of a sort of a purpley pink color and they don't, uh, they don't reproduce through parthenogenesis, but they tend to be a little more secretive. In some ways they'll do more burrowing. They can do really well in a situation like that. And then another one would be Porcelionides prunosus, the powders. Powder blue, powder orange are various color varieties. They have the Oreo crumbles and they have the orange cream, many different varieties, but they uh, tend to be, they're referred to as a polite isopod, like not likely to harm uh, other inhabitants of an enclosure, breed really quickly, stay on the smaller side, not really a dwarf, but stay smaller and breed fast enough that they can often handle some predation. Okay. And all of these would, would generally probably leave eggs alone if they were, um, I mean, is there any, I, what evidence is there that they, uh, isopods actually will attack a living egg? Well, that's, I think we need more data on that. Um, okay. I can say that uh, most isopods would not hesitate to go after a dead egg. I mean, or an infertile egg. They would just, that would be dinners on the table right there. But uh, as far as knowing how often they actually attack live eggs and, and so on, it's a difficult to say. I know that I have, I have a crested gecko, well, my wife does, uh, that lives in a bioactive enclosure, has for years, and despite the fact that it's never mated, you know that parthenogenesis can occur in crested geckos, and it has, because she's, she's produced three offspring, despite the fact that we got her as a tiny baby and she's never mated. Uh, we found offspring just showing up in the enclosure. So there are dwarf whites that live in that substrate, and obviously some eggs are surviving and, and growing up and, and hatching in a natural manner in that substrate. And so, and I, and I have other enclosures with other geckos, like morning geckos and so on, with other isopods in there, and I've never had an issue with them eating eggs. Morning geckos, of course, aren't burying their eggs typically. They tend to lay, lay them high up on structures, but I do find isopods high up on structures too. So I think I can't say that there's no risk uh, of isopods eating eggs because I don't have enough data. But I can say there are plenty of occasions where isopods and eggs have coexisted successfully. Okay. Now, these isopods that you've discussed, uh, how easy is it to find those? Most of those are really pretty easy to find. Okay. Um, it, they vary widely in price. And are you talking just about the ones in the last scenario or all of them in general? Uh, all of them. Okay. Oh. Most of those are very easy to find. You can find vendors who have them available. Some of them are quite expensive, like the Marulanella genus. Almost everything in that genus is quite pricey. Uh, the Porcelio expensis is also fairly expensive, not as expensive, but still pretty pricey. But some of those are very cheap. You can get uh, a deli cup full of 25 to 50 of them for five to 10 bucks. 
um, for some of the cheaper ones. And it goes up from there, but the, the powders, the, uh, the dwarf whites, the dwarf purples, the um, Florida fast, and the dairy cows and the milkbacks are all quite reasonably priced. Okay. All right. Is there anything, as I, as I wrestle with my decision as to what to put in there, is there anything else that you think we should know? Hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, <coughs> I think this is a, a great thing that you're exploring. And I think one thing we need to do is all of us need to be citizen scientists to some degree with this. Because like I mentioned, we don't have enough data for some of these things. And when we have a successful system and we document how we put it together, which species are occurring, how we maintain those species, um, we can start to build uh, more data so that other people can, can, in some cases, just kind of say, oh, here's a setup that works, so I'm going to mimic that setup. Or here's a setup that works, I'm going to try to tweak it and see if it still works. Um, the more we do that, the more we share our results the better off we're going to be in the hobby at large just because everybody's going to have more more information to draw on. Okay. And before you go, uh, tell us what Aquarimax is. What do you do there? Well, I have uh, an eclectic um, assortment of, of creatures. Uh, I've, I have a, a YouTube channel. I have an Instagram and so on. The, the YouTube channel is Aquarimax Pets, uh, and basically all my social media is based off of that. Uh, and I love to share all the things that I discover. I, I do a lot of, uh, I do videos twice a week, essentially, and it's all about anything you can put in an aquarium or vivarium. So I've done videos on dark frogs. I've done videos on geckos. I've done videos on um, many types of arthropods that people keep. Isopods are one of my specialties, but uh, I'm not limited to that. I also keep shrimp. I keep fish. I keep uh, snakes. I breed uh, snakes and I, I do all kinds of things like that and I also have guests on uh, in fact Bill we were talking about this and you're gonna be a guest on my channel soon I'm looking forward to that uh -huh. so uh, when especially when those guests have an expertise that I I don't share so for example your expertise in chameleons I've never kept chameleons I babysat one for a short time but that's that's the extent of my experience so I love to have guests on that can help um, broaden the scope of the channel by sharing their expertise as well. And that is a live show, correct? Typically, yes. I, I sometimes we do the uh, recorded, pre-recorded format, but typically it's live. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, when is it? Uh, Wednesdays, uh, five thirty uh, Mountain Time, U.S. Mountain Time, okay. and that's uh, we're going to be in February. It'll be a Wednesday. Uh, I think we decided the seventh. Yep. That, yeah. uh, February 7th is Chameleon Day on uh, the Aquarium Max. Yeah, uh, so channel. everybody come check that out. That should be fun. So, all right. I think I have what I need to go forward. I'm going to do some hard thinking, and uh, you know, I'll come back if I have any more questions. Yeah, please do, and I'll look forward to hearing uh, what you decide to, to put together. Me too. I'll let you know. All right. All right. Great. Thank you very much, Russ. Yeah, thanks, Bill, for having me.